Nobody likes me. He's the baddest man in hip hop. Hey, yo, the bottom line is, I'm a crook with a deal. If my record don't sell, I'm a rob a stick. Who hustled his way to the top. Don't come to a fight with Fifth with a knife. You better come with your guns, because he is gonna destroy you. I was like, wow, this guy's gonna make a lot of enemies. I ain't straight for you. This guy's crazy. But for 50 Cent, success didn't come easy. His mother's murder was just the beginning. I found a man dead. Someone put something in a drink, and then they turned the gas on. Dealing crack, he played a dangerous game until he found a new hustle. <laughs> Music. He was always confident. That's what struck me about him. He knew he was going to blow. Bringing his street edge to the rap world, 50 Cent took on all challengers. 50 just punches him in his eye. At that point, I believe, is when Ja started to piece sitting down like a woman. He started being a man. Collecting enemies, he became a marked man. People were coming after him because they felt he was such a threat. They put the money on his head, and that's when everybody started getting scared. And nine bullets nearly ended it all. It happened that fast. I thought he was dead. 50 came out the other side stronger and more determined than ever. I've never allowed my fear to limit me. What it made him was a monster. Nothing's gonna stop him. Turning his anguish into fame and fortune. The other rapper you know got his own beverage. Never afraid. Never backing down. If Kanye West sells more records than 50 Cent, I'll no longer write music. 50 Cent has lived by his own notorious words, get rich or die trying. I'm addicted to success. Oh, it's absolutely my vice. This is his story behind the music. It's a raucous night in California, and 50 Cent is about to hit the stage at the Bamboozle Fest. I'm nervous. Headlining a rock festival might seem strange for a hip-hop icon, but that's the kind of power 50 Cent wields. It's very rewarding. When you make the right music, it feels so good. I'm so high when the music is right. Fifty Savers moments like these, they're a reminder of where he is and how far he's come. I've never allowed my fear to limit me. I believe you can will your way in a good situation. Go out and make things happen. was born Curtis James Jackson III on July 6, 1975 in Jamaica, Queens. His mother, Sabrina, was just 15. He never knew his father. I asked my mother one time, he was in the park. I saw a little boy throwing the football back and forth with his father. And I said, well, I don't got no father, mom. And she said, because you're special. He was born to the Immaculate Conception. Like Jesus, boy. Now go play. Sabrina moved out of the house shortly after Curtis was born. He was raised by his grandparents, who had nine children of their own. He was a special child. At least I thought so. He was a very happy little boy. He was kind of like uh, my son, because I had raised him with my other kids. But he was just the little weasel that was in the bunch. Curtis's mom wasn't around much. She was a drug dealer on the streets of Southside, Jamaica, one of New York's roughest neighborhoods. She didn't see public assistance as an option. So she did what she had to do to take care of me, and I was hustling. It wasn't talked about like, you know, we knew for sure that she was dealing drugs, but we knew that she had large sums of money. She spoiled him. Every time she come to see him, she would bring him a, a lot of presents. My mom was, it was everything to me. Every time I seen her, it was Christmas. So I associated everything good with my mom's coming. But one day when Curtis was eight, his mom didn't show up for a family visit. 
We knew something was wrong. We went over to her apartment to see what was going on. When I went in the house, I found her laying dead. Someone put something in a drink, and then they turned the gas off. She spent a few days in the space that she was in after she passed away, so her body was all decomposed by the time they got to her. I remember my grandmother explaining it like she's not going to come back. She's in a better place. And um, I didn't understand that at that point. Well, he was a little boy, baby boy. You can't tell her a child like that, nothing much. He had went to the funeral and everything, but he didn't know what was going on. But I could tell he missed his mother. The way he dealt with it, he would just act out. Destructive, with break things and get angry a lot. By the time Curtis was 12, he was following in his mother's footsteps as her friend showed him the ropes. He saw the drug dealers with a lot of money and in flashing clothes, and he wanted to emulate them. Nice places to stay, nice cars, nice jewelry. They appeared to have the actual life that I wanted. From their perspective, they were helping me. They go, well, I'm going to give you this. You know what to do with this? And it's three and a half grand. So from three to six, when my grandparents thought I was in the after-school program, I was hustling. I know 50 is hustling his whole life. That's how I knew him. It's boo, boo When he was 12, he was on the block with, like, guys that were 17, 18. Everybody knew Boo Boo. Like, what is this little kid doing out here with the wolves? They call it Crack Alley, Jamaica, Queens. In the late 80s, Southside was the epicenter of New York's crack epidemic. Curtis cooked it at his friend's house, stashed it in his room, then sold it. Everybody around us, like all my friends, that's what they did. Cook it up, bag it up, and you might make $1,000 one day. And then you might have your slow days when you make $100. I was standing there with the entrepreneur spirit, and I had to be aggressive, real aggressive. Curtis did what it took to survive in the neighborhood. To make himself a more imposing presence on the street, he joined a youth boxing program. I used to get my ass kicked a lot. I went to the boxing gym. I learned something there. Go right across the street and try it. And start the altercation. Like, I actually seen him break somebody's jaw before. And that's when everybody really knew, like, 50 could fight. Everybody respected him. Um, and if you didn't, he would make you. To further defend himself, 50 got his hands on a gun. And I used it. I used it a bunch of times. I ain't hit a lot of people with it, but I used that they didn't know I would shoot it. It changed their whole perspective on me based on that. I saw his lifestyle start to change. When he was in the house with us, we saw Curtis, but I've heard stories on how aggressive he was in the street. Like two different people. When he was 14, Curtis was arrested for bringing drugs to school. A judge sentenced him to rehab, where he quickly learned how to hustle the system. I never really indulged in the usage of drugs. But they teach you, like, the 12 steps, and I had to kind of act as if to get out of it. It works if you work it, so work it. Hi, my name is Curtis Jackson, and I'm an addict. At 17, Curtis was busted again when cops searched his home and found heroin, cocaine, and $15,000 in cash. He was running wild at that time. His grandfather tried to discipline him, but he felt that he should have done more. You can teach a kid to be the best that he is in the world. But if he don't take it in, it ain't gonna do him no good. That probably was one of the biggest disappointments for my grandparents to see that I had went into that lifestyle because that's how they lost my mom. The charges could have sent him to prison for nine years. But as a teenager facing his first felony, he was offered an alternative. Shock! Shock! Shock incarceration. Hit it! Go! Hit it! Six months in a military-style boot camp. I think it definitely changed him. He knew more. He knew the system. He knew how things worked. Very smart guy. I'm a part of the success rate of the shop program. It works! It works! It works! You see, it depends on how you look at things. I slipped back into my ways after the actual... 
after the actual program. But it worked for me because I've never been incarcerated since. Curtis went back to dealing, but he knew his luck was inspired by rappers who turned their gritty street stories into cold, hard cash. Curtis came up with a new hustle. I decided I was going to write music for a living. He told me that his probation officer had suggested that he goes into rapping. One, two, three, and here we go. Then one day in 1996, he had a chance meeting with Run DMC's Jam Master J at a Manhattan nightclub. I kind of hustled my way into a situation with Jay. I didn't have nothing. I went straight into talking to him like I knew how to do it. I think it was the way 50 approached him. He just liked the way he said he's going to be big. And he was like, all right, we'll stop by and hear what you got. Curtis recorded a rough demo track for Jay. It just went on and on and on. So he's like, yo, what's the hook? What Jay heard was raw, but very real. Seeing potential, he signed Curtis to his label. And just like that, the 21-year-old crack dealer had a new calling. He told me he was working with a famous rapper. I said, you sure that's what you want to be? So he said, yes. Coming up, 50 Cent goes on the attack. Faded now and never again. We ain't buddies, we ain't partners, and we damn sure ain't friends. And pays a heavy price. You don't know if you're actually gonna survive it or not. And later, he blows away a hip hop icon. I was like, yo, this 50, I, I quit. I literally wanted to quit rapping at that point. When behind the music continues. <laughs> By 1996, Curtis Jackson had transformed himself from a streetwise drug dealer to budding rapper after being signed by Run DMC's Jam Master J. To complete his evolution, he created a new identity, taking the name of a well-known Brooklyn stick-up artist, 50 Cent. For me, 50 Cent was a metaphor for change, and then I would do things my way, which would be drastically different. An even bigger change came a year later. When Curtis was just 22, he and his girlfriend, Shaniqua Tompkins, had a baby boy, Marquise. He got more serious about life than he knew he had to take care of his son. I wanted to have the relationship that I didn't have with my father and my son. I didn't believe anyone would take care of him if I wasn't there to take care of him. 50 gave up dealing drugs and sold off everything he had to support his family. He pinned his hopes on music, learning from Jam Master Jay. 50 would not want to leave the studio. Dude was just soaking everything in. He would just stay focused over in the corner, right, right, right. Two years passed. Progress was slow, and 50 was frustrated that he didn't have Jay's undivided attention. So when he saw record executive Corey Rooney outside a barbershop in Queens, he seized the opportunity. He comes over to the car. He had, like, his hood on and looked sketchy. At that point, I know he's going to rob me. I gave him my tape and put it in, playing it, and the phone rang and he was on the telephone. I'm like, uh, yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And he gave me the look because I wasn't paying attention. I give him my tape, man. He's mad old school. <laughs> he looked at me like, what's the matter with him? He doesn't realize I can multitask, so I heard everything he did. This was far beyond, oh, this guy is good. I thought, wow, this is the next Jay-Z. 50 was signed to Columbia Records, but most of his advance went to pay his way out of the J contract. Broke, he returned to dealing. I had $5,000. And then the baby. So I had to take care of him. I just bought 250 grand with it and went back to doing what I knew how to do. 50 took only two weeks to record his debut, but the label let it languish for two years. In 1999, he channeled his frustration into a lyrical assault on the biz. Hey, yo, the bottom line is, I'm a crook with a deal. If my record don't sell, I'm a robber still. You a track about mugging music stars called How to Rob. What do you have out right now? I got a new single out called How to Rob. I'm about to stick Bobby for some of that with me money. I wrote the lyrics in like... 45 minutes. That's from your heart, that's how you feel. Yeah, that's, you know, it's a little kind of like comedy based on reality. The people going off. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he was like, all right, this industry is not letting me eat. They're not letting me in. All right, I'm going to rob everybody in this industry and let you know I'm coming. What you could just sell, like four million? Got something to live for. When I heard the record, I was like, wow, this guy's going to make a lot of enemies. This guy's crazy. The single was a sensation. DMX, Big Pun, the Wu-Tang Clan, and Jay-Z all fired back. Go against Jigga, your ass is dense. I'm about a dollar, what the fuck is 50 cents? That right there, that's when everybody was like, all right, Jay just said his name. 50 cents. And he's official. 50 Cent was making enemies, but none bigger than fellow Queens rapper Ja Rule. One of my homies Rob. Ja for his chain. His energy shift towards me and we ain't never been cool since. Fifth was the street dude, he wasn't. And Fifth was like, all right, I'm gonna get this little punk. Nobody likes The violence escalated in March 2000 when Ja Rule's crew paid a visit to 50 at the Hit Factory recording studio in Manhattan. This time, someone pulled a knife. They did knock on the door. They cut the lights off, they ran in swinging these, you know, steak knives. I seen 50 pick up one of the speakers. Boom, hit one of them got blood everywhere. And they cut 50. They called it a stabbing and it sounded more graphic than it actually was. See, this is what they did to me, little boo-boo. It wasn't too bad. I had three stitches. I got worse riding my pedal bike. 50's rep as rap's new bad boy was growing. But that actual altercation, it started to spiral out of control. People were coming after him because they felt he was such a threat. It got ugly. He didn't know who to trust. You know, they put, they put the money on his head. You didn't know what was next, and you didn't know who would do it. And that's when everybody started getting scared. May 24th, 2000. Something finally caught up with 50 outside his grandmother's house in Queens. He was going out the door, in which I went out behind him. My son was in the house and my grandmother was in the front yard. I stopped to weed the flowers. 50 got into the back seat of a friend's car. Another car pulled up beside them. It happened that fast. I hear something shooting like firecrackers. I thought it was kids, I was gonna yell at them, but when I see this guy pointing in the car, and I says, oh, that's the car my grandson got in. 50 reached for his gun. But it wasn't cocked. When I put the gun out the actual window, he shot down at my hand and moved away. So I got hit my thumb and came out the top of my pinky. That's why I ain't got no knuckle on my right hand. He was also hit in his face, his legs, nine bullets in all. Fired at close range. I can't give you the movie moment because I didn't look down the barrel of the gun. And then I started yelling. Then they won. Blood gushed all over the back seat as the friend sped toward a hospital, stopping only to dump 50's gun in a sewer. I kept saying, oh, son, you shot me in my face, huh? Look in the mirror in the middle of the car. 50 was rushed into surgery. You don't know if you're actually going to survive it or not. I get that call, so me 50 got shot. So I run to his block, and then I just see shells all over. You know, they had homicide police. I thought he was dead. Coming up, 50 faces his darkest hour. At one point in the hospital room, he lifted his hand and went like this. It kind of made you feel like the only thing that you could really do legitimately is find the source of the actual problem and just kill him. In the spring of 2000, 50 Cent was on the cusp of rap stardom when he was ambushed outside his grandmother's house in Queens and shot nine times. I'm driving in the highway, and all of a sudden I hear on the radio, 50 Cent, he shot. So what? Rapper 50 Cent is in critical condition after having been shot today. Headed straight to the hospital, and saw all his family in the lobby. They were crying. It's like, this is for real? This is for real? When I saw him, um, he had tubes all over his body, and he was unconscious. He was unconscious. He was just laying there. I was there every day, praying for him. Because a bullet went through my face and into my actual tongue area and knocked my teeth out. My tongue had swollen up to the point that I was almost suffocating myself. To clear his airway, doctors wanted to perform a tracheotomy. It was a critical decision for 50's family. But he told me if they're operating on him, he may not talk again. So that's when I said no. If I had to talk with one of the things that made me sound like, then that would be the end of that. If he couldn't do his music, he would be lost without it. 
His grandmother's prayers were answered. 50 survived without the operation, but he faced an uphill battle. He was weak, he was fragile. Um, of course, he was hurting. I don't know what it feels like to die, but it doesn't look like it hurts as much as a hospital bed. In the hospital room, I remember getting close to 50 and looking at him. I said, I know you're upset. I know you want to get these dudes. And he lifted his hand and went like this. Couldn't talk, but he went like this. It kind of made you feel like the only thing that you could really do legitimately is find the source of the actual problem and just kill him. In pain, unable to walk, his jaw wired shut. There was a sadness that he had, and that sadness was because he didn't know what was going to happen with the rest of his life. The actual shooting. That's not even the most painful thing I went through. The most pain I've been through is the confusion. Not knowing whether I'd be able to do rap for a living. Ever the survivor, 50 began the grueling process of rebuilding his body. I've never allowed my fear to limit me. I'll figure out how to get past it. I think everything else is smaller than the loss of my mom. When he came back around after the shooting, he had slimmed up. He chiseled up. He looked like the Terminator. What did not kill him definitely made him stronger. 50 was ready to conquer hip hop, but there was one problem. His label, Columbia, was scared off by all the controversy. He was complete level seven threat. Listen, they wanted him dead. The money was on his head. No executive wanted to be around him. They didn't want to inherit no problem. So they said, OK, let this guy go. They dropped me. Like I couldn't even get them to answer the phone. 50 approached other labels, but found no takers. We went to so many record labels where executives were actually shaking while we're in the meeting, shaking, knees shaking. We were riding around, bulletproof vests on. It was crazy. The vest and having a, a pistol that was already cocked was mandatory. P. Diddy offered 50 a job as a songwriter, but he wasn't exactly thrilled to find out his new employee was packing. Puffy was the first person to call me back to work. I was in his office. Like, I just heard an altercation outside, and he came in, and I pulled my pistol out. And he put it on the desk, and they were like, oh, it's really real. I had developed the paranoia. As soon as something don't feel right, I'm shooting whoever, because I'm not getting shot again. Puff was a little like, yo, that's, I don't need this in my life right now, which is understandable. Bad boy for life. He went down that road. That was the last time he called me to write music. <laughs> Rejected yet again, 50 knew that he would have to do it on his own. So he started releasing independent albums known as mixtapes. His hustle was at a 10, this jumped to like 100. One of his tracks, F.U., was aimed straight at his attackers.